Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where sales leaders teach you what's working for them so you can build it yourself. This episode of the Predictable Revenue Podcast is brought to you by our sales coaching and consulting services. Are you looking to create repeatable, scalable, and predictable revenue? We've helped thousands of companies grow their business with tailored expert advice backed by testing to ensure they establish the best practices that will work for them. Head over to bit.ly forward slash predictable coaching to learn more. Welcome back to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Stewart. Today, I'm joined by Austin LaRoche. He's the CEO over at Attack Interactive. And today, we're going to have a little bit of a cage match. This is marketing versus sales. We're going to talk about where marketing fails sales and where sales fails marketing. And hopefully, we can end this uh, big fight with a kumbaya campfire uh, singing session. We won't actually sing, but maybe we can kind of figure out how the two teams can come together, work a little bit better together throughout the process. I think today's going to be the day. I think we are going to finally kill all silos of marketing and sales. We're going to get on the exact same page, just like we've all been trying to for hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to it. it. Or it'll turn into basically a Festivus, like the Seinfeld reference, where we're just airing our grievances. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So leading in, I mean, maybe let's start a little bit with your journey here, because I know I know you're the CEO over at Attack. Um, help me provide some context to the audience of where you're going to come, because we're going to talk about, you know, where marketing fail, fails sales, but I think it's important to start with a bit of context. So we're not looking for like the elevator pitch of like what Attack does, but help, help the audience understand the context of what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and where you're coming from with, you know, these where marketing, you know, uh, these marketing fails. Okay. Well, many, many moons ago, uh, Attack Interactive uh, acquired my uh, old company, which was a little bit more based in social media. Uh, I kind of got into it uh, in the late 2000s. I was working at Chicago Tribune. It was all very new and uh, I had a lot of B2C clients. But once I got acquired from Attack, uh, a lot of these things changed. And we were still in the, one of those phases where you know a lot of business owners don't like to admit they were ever here, but I've got no problem where... Hey, if, if we could kind of do what you needed, we were saying yes. All right. We were saying yes to everybody as we built our, our company up. And it just so happened that so many of the things we were saying yes to were B2B. And so we kept growing the company off B2B marketing and really diving into a lot of the different trends across lead generation, conversion rate optimization, and content. And I think one of the reasons why we were able to grow the way that we were and definitely grow out of the state where we will just take anybody, thank God. Um, was because I think that we really took marketing responsibly and we put real KPIs to everything that we did and recognize that when companies uh, hire an agency, their expectation is that they're going to grow. Their expectation isn't just that their website's going to look nicer, their PowerPoints will be prettier. Uh, and I think there's a real responsibility, I know we'll get to in a little bit on marketing, that we are really, really proud of uh, being able to go in and say, we get it. We understand it. You grow or we go. Those are the stakes. Uh, and about five years ago, I would say as we were on that trajectory, the one thing I really recognized was just the need for technical marketing and to be able to get systems to talk to one another. Um, we do a lot with HubSpot. We do a lot with Salesforce and recognizing that we have these systems and we have all these opportunities to automate messages and get the right messages, the right person at the right time. And we are doing everything we can to work with sales teams across the country to be able to create those ideal instances so that we can have this harmonious relationship where we are sending out what needs to be sent out, automating what needs to be automated, and we're making sales teams' lives easier, not uh, getting in their way. Um, so that's a little bit of the background on me and uh, how we got here. Cool. And one of the interesting pieces that I thought would would make for a good episode is we both run agencies of about the same size. You your focus is on marketing. My focus is a little more on sales, sales development. Um, and so, I think from our experience, you kind of anytime I'm looking at like an external marketing person being involved in a company, you're always like, it's like a you never know what you're going to get, right? It could be like a very brand person who doesn't want to send a cold email. It could be a really helpful person who's like, hey, what do you all need for this campaign? Right, like what kind of materials, and it, it it can really vary. And I think that this kind of um, 
both both folks in those instances are coming from a good place. And I think this this episode is going to be a little bit about calibrating and how do we on both sides kind of calibrate the use of marketing resources, sales resources, sales development resources to kind of bring them all together. So mm-hmm. with that, I want to talk about the first kind of I, first area that I've probably screwed up as somebody who led marketing and sales was in the early days, we focused way too much on demand or on brand and not demand. The amount of time we spent on values and what the brand looked like and uh, I'm disappointed in myself. You know, we wanted to, um, we were trying to grow the company and we spent all, like more money than I'd like to admit on like name, tagline, mission, all this like mushy stuff that felt good at the time, sort of like doing drugs, felt good at the time, but didn't actually produce a whole lot other than a bit of a hangover. It didn't act, it didn't move the needle at all. And so I'm curious your thoughts. Um, is, is this something that, uh, is this common? Is this uncommon? Did I do the right thing? Did I do the wrong thing? I think you did a natural evolution that uh, many companies did, right? Because brand strategy is fun. It makes you feel good and it never loses, right? So I can understand why there's so many people who want to help you build your brand because they they are always going to pump you up and get you really excited in the short term, right? Now, I think what we're realizing is a lot of the, a lot of marketing of the past, you know, was more of the art than the science. There is this marriage of art and science and, and marketing and you think, oh my God, I got this idea. It's so clever. It's so cool. And you put an ad in your industry trade and you'd have this cool looking booth and three people could walk by and say something nice and you'd feel like that was a success. Mm-hmm. But now everything we're doing is about A-B testing. I'll tell you a great story. When we started doing Google ads for our our, uh, uh, our company, I wrote all the copy because I was a creative writing major. I know how to write what people are going to like and it's punchy and cool. And gosh, I, I, every time I looked at it, I was like, oh, I'd want to click on them. So we ran up for a few weeks, kind of crickets, right? And my my ad team was like, hey, Austin, here's what some of the competitors are doing. It's just kind of straightforward, clear, concise. I'm like, boring. No way. Like, this is better it's, it's, than everybody else. Yes. Yes. And so then they said, well, because we're not getting results here, could you maybe open your mind here, creative genius, and let us just do it this way that you're calling boring? And I'm like, sure, guys, sure. And sure enough, a lot more conversions started rolling in. And what I realized very humbly in that moment was that we are in an A-B testing world and we can all think that we have this awesome message. But the fact of the matter is, is we have the opportunity to send so many different messages to our target audience and we let them tell us, let the data tell us what's actually engaging, what actually is exciting for them and what actually breaks through. And so I think that you're going to see that more. Uh, I do believe that a lot of the brand focused uh, marketing is going to subside because I mean, for many reasons, I was playing with the AI logo generator yesterday, right? Like, you know, and they were spitting out some cool stuff and maybe we didn't go through an exercise where it was like, if your brand was a car, what kind of car would it be? But so it's pretty clear to a lot of people now that you don't need to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think the brand side it, and I'll also say I work up a lot more in the B2B uh, space. I think B2C is definitely a lot more brand focus. I don't want I don't want to knock on on uh, brand marketing too much, but I definitely mm-hmm. think in the B2B space you're finding a lot more rewards uh, when you're you're focusing a lot more on demand. A hundred percent. And I think as a as a founder, it was one of the first big mistakes I made when I hired my first marketing person was hiring somebody who was brand focused and not demand focused. Maybe help help people understand the difference. Just at a you know, give us like a minute on like you know, what does yeah, what does that phrase that I just said mean? So when we go back to where I was talking about taking that responsibility of marketing, demand marketing is when you go okay, we are marketing because we know that we need to generate leads. That's what we're here to do. Okay, and so the focus when you're doing demand marketing is to be able to build your presence, get more leads in the pipeline, help convert more leads to sales. And it's really focused on that, you know, growth element. It's a lot more ingrained in sales. When you're on the brand side, it's a lot more about messaging, 
right? It's about making things look a certain way. And look, you can go to my website, www.attackinteractive.com, and you will see I love good design. I love it. It looks great. But at some point, there's got to be some substance there. And I think a lot more, a lot of times the brand marketer is really, really concentrated on certain things, like everything aligning, everyone having the same footer in the company and everyone having the, uh, the same social media, or the same uh, banner on their LinkedIn profile and having that brand alignment and everything the same way. And I think that is probably why salespeople really uh, have a hard time with with brand marketers because they want them to be a lot more on the demand side you know, because they're just screaming, where are my leads? What, what, what can you do to help me get these guys a little further down the funnel? So is that a, is that a fair enough explanation for the audience? <laughs> hundred percent. And I think here's, you're, you're totally right on the head where like, this is where the conflict come from, comes from. If you're an account exec sitting there saying, Hey, you know, my company's spending all this money on, on marketing, but all they're doing is logo and brand and design work. Like, how is that helping me? And it's my job to help grow this company and to bring in new customers. And in some ways, if you're a salesperson, that's really all that matters. Yeah, it's cool that we got a nice brand. It's cool that, you know, the website looks good or doesn't look bad, but you know, they're almost hygiene factors. You know, if you go back to like your, you know, any psych classes you took in university where they don't add any additional happiness, but they can like a crappy looking website will just, uh, will take away some happiness or some satisfaction from a customer, but a really amazing looking website doesn't add any, it's like, it goes on a scale like zero to negative 10. And I think the, where salespeople get frustrated or have been frustrated and where I've been frustrated is when. It comes down to like prioritization of like resources, focusing on brand, not focusing enough on the demand side. And I didn't have those words in the early days, which is one of the reasons I wanted to start at this place. Because when you're, if you're coming from a brand side, like there's nothing wrong with brand as we talked about. And in some, com in some cases, it was really important for us to kind of get all on the same page with messaging. But when that brand effort starts to leak into, okay, well, I want the sales development campaigns to have this messaging. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. There's a time and a place for brand. And I think when you get into, like you wouldn't take your brand and say, okay, now I'm going to use my brand to dictate, or my brand and my brand messaging to dictate the keywords that we go after for SEO, right? Like that's just not, that's a, that's a bad idea that I think, I don't know much about marketing, but I think we could all agree that's probably a bad idea. So you're, you're I mean, there's some alignment for sure, but you're not going to go and be like, okay, take these branded keywords and you know, optimize your whole website for these branded keywords. Of course, what you're going to do is, and same with cold email, is like, we want to be open to a test. We're going to try anything. We want to find the right messaging that works. And this is not to disparage marketing or people that get their messaging from marketing. But I think to your point, anytime I'm happy with messaging that I've written, I know it's bad. I know it's not going to do well. And in time, I'm like, oh, that's clever. I really like it. I'm like, there's like a red flag that goes off. It's like, hmm this is going to do quite poorly. Yeah. I also think going back to what I was talking about, about, let the data make the right decision. I feel like a lot of times sales is talking to the prospect, is talking to the customer. And so they're understanding a lot of the customer hesitations, a lot of the pain points, a lot of the problems that are trying to be solved. And I feel like where marketing can miss the boat is if they're trying to come up with that message without the input of the people who are talking to the, the prospects and customers day in and day out. Because that to me is, is vital, it is, is really recognizing who do we have that we're currently working with and what what is resonating with them. And, and I think marketing doing that sort of just internal research uh, could, could really help out a lot in making sure that when they do have suggestions, that they do start uh, putting certain messages, it's a lot more consistent with what people on the ground are actually saying. A hundred percent. And I, I think in that instance, that's not necessarily a, this is a marketer put into a role where they're trying to do the best they can, right? If you're joining a company and you're in marketing or sales and there's no product leader or there's nobody who owns the customer or there's nobody who can, can introduce you to these customers to help you understand those things. I think this is the, the one thing that I think services businesses or hardware businesses miss from a, that I think software businesses do a really great job of. And I shouldn't say all software businesses, but when you're starting something new, you do all this customer development, you do the research, um, you're doing 
um, and at least when I do it, I'm talking to customers. I'm talking to prospects or people that could be company cust- become customers, and I'm asking them what their unmet needs are. And I, I got a process for going through it, and it's that initial genesis of you know, okay, this is this is where this is who we're reaching out to and why. That's where this comes from. If you hire a marketer into your organization or a salesperson or a sales leader or any sort of revenue leader, and you don't say, here's that nugget and you pass it to them, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get this marketer who shows up and looks at the marketing site, goes, ah, it's not good enough and looks at your marketing materials and then just starts going. But if they don't get the opportunity to sit and interview customers and like you said, you know, develop that empathy, develop that understanding, develop that awareness. I I don't care what side of the marketing or sales table you're sitting on. You're probably you know, hitting off the back foot. Yeah, absolutely. I'll get off my soapbox here. Um, One thing you've mentioned about um, tying KPI or tying marketing spend to KPIs was, you know, one thing that comes up is an accountability uh, to the marketing spend. Help me understand that when, you know, yeah, help me understand your thoughts on like how marketing is or hasn't been uh, accountable to the marketing spend. Well, I think, you know, what we're all trying to do on both the marketing and sales side is get attribution right, right? And we all want a little piece of that pie. And uh, it seems like it should be a science, but it's not. It's not because we're talking to so many different people at, at different at different uh, stages. So I think when it comes to, to marketing, you got to really define what it is that you're trying to drive. And I think a lot of times in our space, it's not that difficult. It's sales qualified leads, Right. It's good leads. Like that, that's really what most sales teams want from marketing. Uh, you know, uh, they don't really care about the partner where, you know, we put all the effort into making sure that we've got uh, the best landing pages with all the social proof and that our conversion rates are really high relative to the traffic that's coming in or all the work that we're doing to get them there. They, they don't care. At the end of the day, they want sales qualified leads. And so that's why I always try and, and work from where I say a uh, more goal focused place and scope focus. Because I, I, God bless a lot of the agencies out there that can just give you these packages where you have a certain amount of SEO keywords and we'll write three blogs a month for you and all this kind of stuff. God bless them. I'm, if they make up money and feeding their families and, and employing good people, great. I can't do that because I know what people want today is, is the goal, which is, let's say, X amount of leads. And so I'm going to utilize all my resources across SEO across uh, paid social, across paid search, um, and anything else that I can do to do what I can to deliver the sales qualified leads. And I'm going to do a lot of A-B testing to get there. And it's not going to be like some clear cut package. And I even when I think I got the formula, I'm going to need to keep optimizing it time again, because different things are always going to sway. So I think when it comes to, um, I, I and that's why I feel like I work a lot better with sales leaders than marketing leaders, to be honest, uh, because it kind of feels uncomfortable sometimes when I'm working with marketing leaders and like, you know, they're, they're really pushing for metrics that they're kind of vanity metrics. I didn't think web traffic is a vanity metric. Like I don't think that really matters. Uh, but when yeah. we say, listen, sales qualified leads, that's what we want. We, we want yeah. you to go, Hey, that lead that came in from that campaign, they were awesome. We just signed them up. That was like, that's a huge deal for us. Like nothing feels better in our world because that's, that's the pressure we put on ourselves, and um, I think that I think the future of marketing is going to follow suit. I, I had a little laugh when you said, you know, website traffic is a, is a vanity metric, because um, I, I think you're totally right. And it triggered a funny story at the beginning of this year. Web traffic at PR fell off overnight from like January to February, fifteen hundred uh, users a month. It wasn't catastrophic, but I was like, it's a big enough drop that we went from one month to the other. I was like, I need to understand what happened. Hey, do, do you want to take a guess? What would be an uh, honest guess and then give me a silly guess? What do you think happened? Um, uh, we don't do any ads. We don't do any ads. Nothing had changed marketing wise. I'll give you the dorky answer. Google Web Vitals. They finally docked you for having a slow website. I, I don't think that's the fun answer you're looking for, the practical one that came to my mind. I went to everything in marketing and sales. I was looking through every source and it was finally 
um, I was venting to somebody that I couldn't figure this out. And Carla goes, oh, we turned off all of our recruiting ads. <laughs> so, oh, 1500, 50, we were running ads, but I just, I wasn't thinking through like the marketing demand gen side. And we were, we had a ton of ads on Indeed and LinkedIn, and that was bringing a heap of traffic every month. And I, I wish I could say I figured it out quicker, but I didn't. Um, That's really funny. I'll, I'll tell you my quick story on that. At the end of, I think it was 2016, I was like, why don't we showcase all the websites that we built this year and we'll do like the best websites of 2017 and we'll do a December, right? So that when people are looking, we got that year, we'll get to that SEO juice. And oh my gosh, 90% of my traffic came from that, uh, that blog back, uh, in 2017. And we put all the different visual CTAs we could download this, download that zero, zero leads from, from the edge that was getting 90% of our traffic. A lot of, uh, you know, a lot of young web developers or web designers got some inspiration and I think, but, uh, you know, so yeah, I, I do think that, uh, web traffic can be quite the bad any metric. A hundred percent. I do think on the sales side to kind of dovetail in, like, you know, if, if marketing where marketing fails is a lack of accountability and focusing too much on the vanity metrics. I think if we're talking about leads and generating leads, I think one area where sales people have, uh, can fall down is only wanting the good leads and only wanting the best of the best leads. And I don't want to say being lazy, um, cause it's not being lazy. It's about prioritizing. And if I'm, if I have so many things to do as an account exec, especially if I'm a full cycle account exec, I have to prioritize because your job is you, you can only do 70% of your job. Well, right. If you're a full cycle, right. You've got a uh, hundred units of time and there's 140 units of work to do every day, or at least that's what it feels like. Don't check <laughs> my math on that. It's, it's probably, <laughs> but, <laughs> and so if I'm getting these leads, I try a couple and they don't go anywhere. I'm like, ah, fuck it. These marketing leads aren't, aren't any good. Uh, I'm going to write off the whole source. And I think it comes down to, this is not necessarily a failure of the rep. I don't think this is even a failure of marketing. I think it's a failure of the sales leadership and the systems, because if you have, if you have trained the rep on, okay, this is the source, this is what to expect. This is how we're going to nurture each of these. And then you build the process for doing so even if they are the, the not the greatest leads, those will eventually turn into something. If I'm a salesperson and I have the right person at the right account, I'm going to harass that person forever until they tell me to leave them alone aggressively. You know, it's going to be multiple, like FOAD, uh, is the acronym we used to use. And, uh, I'll let, I'll leave, uh, the listeners to their imagination of what that might mean. Um, but if I got the right person at the right account, they don't have to have budget. I'm going to keep working them because eventually there's going to be something that we can help them with. And so I think that's one area where it's the, when you're looking at the integration between marketing and sales, it's not, I think the salespeople take the blame for it because they're coming off as lazy salespeople when there's a lack of understanding from maybe the marketing or leadership side of like, well, they don't have any systems. There's no enablement. There's no automation. There's no process for doing this. And so you got to look at this and think, okay, from zero to one, what process do I want to follow? Right. And so if you're seeing that, then the answer is not marketing sucks or sales sucks or that Bob, the sales guy sucks. It's you need some process and maybe a touch of automation, but you absolutely should do process first. Yeah. And I also just feel like a lot of times they're, they're not playing in the same sandbox that it's like, they have this, like, it's like a preemptive blame game of like, when things don't go wrong, how do we leave the door open to blame the other one uh, so that we don't you know, we don't have to take, take the hit. And I, I don't think that works well at all. I think as we've probably seen over the last 10 years, so many companies really being able to, um, put those two together and in, in its own department, its own revenue department under a chief revenue officer, I, I, between that and the way the technology speaks to one another and having to play in the same systems, I, I do believe that those silos are breaking down, uh, in, in ways that we've never seen before. But I also think that everybody, like, there has to be a desire, right? There has to be a desire from both sides. And sometimes there's, you know, you feel like you, even when you're on the same team, like you're, in, you're, you're, they're like the enemy, they're the nemesis. And that's never how you want to be working within an organization. 
But I think like you said, when you don't have the right systems and processes in place, that's when that happens, right? The, cha the, the chaos is what leads to the, uh, uh, the friction more so than, you know, the actual work, because I, I do believe that when those, when these two functions are working together in, mm -hmm. in unison, they hum, man. They're it's really great. It, I, it, you probably worked uh, with mar you work with marketers that where things have been really good and where things have been really bad. And when you got that support, I mean, it's so much easier, right? One hundred percent. I think one bitter thought that came came to mind of like, oh, when I used to be an AE was when our marketing team was we we had done all the all the mistakes we've talked about so far on the marketing side, not not PR, but a previous company. And I was sitting there looking at the marketer, and I'm like, well. We both did a mediocre job at our jobs, but you get your full salary and I'm going to get 60% of my salary. And I think there was some some bitterness there because there was a lack of alignment from a, uh, not just a, I mean, I guess incentives, you know, like this marketer was making a good base and a, you know, gets a good bonus if they, they deliver and they did a terrible job so they don't get their bonus, but I'm, I'm not getting my bonus. It's like, I'm not even close to hitting my bonus and I'm not, I'm missing out on like 40% of my commission because this guy didn't do their job, but they still get their full salary. I think that created some like, all right, I won't say their name. I'm not a fan of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, is it their fault? Is the system? There are certain areas in my business where I put commission to my marketers for lead gen and you know, really bringing sales qualified leads to us. I obviously I'm not getting a commission on them because I own the company. But when I, I mm -hmm. uh, when me and other people in the sales department close them, like marketers do get commission for that because it you're right like i mean what a what an awful feeling right like oh you, you oh okay i remember yeah, earlier in my career uh, i was working at a startup and i was the marketing department we'd go to lunch and we'd have all these ideas and the developers would be there till late at night cranking the code and um one day the, the product guy goes brought me to the side and he, he said you know why those guys all hate you and i was like why like, well, you leave on time every day. I'm like, well, yeah, no, I got to get back. Yeah, can you get back home? Uh, and uh, he's like, you go out to lunch for at least an hour every single day. I'm like, yeah, we usually brainstorm and all that kind of stuff there. And he's like, they sleep away at their desk all day. They leave later than you. And you don't ever acknowledge that, ever. Yeah. Now, the difference in that one is they were getting paid three times as much as I was. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it is, there is, and there is a, a stigma with marketing that that can be, true and um and yeah i think marketers should always think about that uh, and i think you, and I, I think that's a really good point that you bring up because i always try and get my team to to get in the shoes of the customer right you know what what do they really want and i i would say that i i rarely think like hey not only are these deals that we're bringing in not only do they want them because so that we're hitting kpis everyone's high five and the company's growing like they, they get a ton of commission on this this is their livelihood, so mm -hmm. we have to deliver for them. That's uh, yeah, that's a something that uh, probably need to be uh, probably they need to be reminded of a little bit more. It's funny when I uh, first started running PR, almost everybody except for our, I think everybody in the company except for our accounting team was on like a variable commission structure because I was like everything's unfair, it's all going to be balanced and this and that and. I think I took it way to an extreme example, and I, I'm a fan of you know bonuses and variable here and there um, when appropriate. But to have every single individual on the in the company except for your accountants uh, on, and I, it was only like accountants. Uh, honestly, yeah, the software engineers weren't on weren't on it either. But yeah, because I was almost in a fist fight with my CTO because he's like, "This is a terrible idea. I, I will literally fight you." Uh, over this, <laughs> we're friends now. He's coming over for dinner tonight, so we're we're fine. We didn't end up throwing down. Listen, we fail upwards. We learn and we learn, right? Totally. Um, talk to me about weaponizing the brand, which we had talked in our pre-interview about. Uh, one of the areas where marketing can fail is is weaponizing the brand. So help me understand that. Weaponizing the brand. Can you elaborate a little bit on what you're looking for there? There's apparently, like apparently, I can't. I think we're maybe we were talking about was, you know, over indexing on brand marketing. And I feel like we've probably covered that a little bit. I think the next one we were talking about is the over automation. And so, oh, okay. Yeah. Over automation is one where, you know, as especially I was telling you earlier, technical marketing, 
we can make so many things. The, because of the capabilities and possibilities of technology, sometimes we get it. Marketing can have a hard time recognizing like when to pump the brakes, right? Mm-hmm. Because, uh, and that's why in, we're, we're talking about automating processes or automating communications. We want to know exactly how that fits into a sales cycle. Because if a if a salesperson moves somebody down the pipeline and then all of a sudden they get a message from marketing and the salesperson has no clue that this is happening and they want to be controlling this entire conversation and then they get an email forwarded to them from the prospect going, hey, what is this? And they're like, what the heck? Like, this is not all what I just talked to these people about. And that's a massive problem. And so automation is one of those things that marketers love because we do understand that we can really, you know, nurture certain prospects. You talked earlier about those uh, prospects that maybe aren't as as warm of leads and uh, we're going to have to like spend six months like kind of hounding them. And we're like, oh, we can nurture them with automation and, and this and this. And so that's where automation feels really good. But when you're working on a really big deal and you want to control every bit of the communication and the marketers are telling you, uh, oh, no, no, no. Once you do this action, it's going to send this communication uh, we've definitely seen some some salespeople who don't necessarily love that, and uh, definitely made some mistakes in figuring out how to get the right balance of being able to use these tools, but not at the, but not overusing them to the point where we're hurting the salespeople's ability to close the deal. Because at the end of the day, I do think marketing's trying to be sales team's best friend, and that that's not what you do to your best friend, right there. I, I might just for fun. <laughs> All right. Um, but yeah, I, I hear that. I think there's you're 100 right. There's a time and a place for for automation. Um, I, I think even salespeople, sales development folks, can be guilty of this. You know, you're trying to build. I think one of the one of the areas where it's easy to over rotate in when you get into sales development is is a similar level of like you're over rotating on automating or building complex workflows and the tools where the salespeople are losing control of the deal. And like, I've been the most extreme example I have of this is a system I built for myself. It was based in, I think it was sugar CRM. And it was back in before I started PR and I was, I hosted my own sugar CRM box and I built this like amazing playbook. It was the best playbook. Um, until I missed a week. And then all of a sudden I had 400 tasks that I had to do that were not out of date. And there was no good way to go back in and like nuke those tasks and just, and so I was constantly behind and then I was out of office for a day and then I got really busy closing deals and then I had to travel for work. And suddenly I was like 4,000 tasks behind and I had all of this automation going of like, do this, automate that, email this. And it was all out of whack. I ended up having to, I had to delete the whole thing. Like I kept the database of like the contacts, but all of the automations, you know, I had built this beautiful mind system where I was on the chalkboard and go, ah, and the whole thing ended up just in the garbage because it didn't leave me enough freedom and flexibility to actually, you know, use my, you know, instincts to say, okay, this is what we got to do next. And I think that's both on the sales side and on the marketing side, a really easy opportunity to uh, get into trouble where you're automating too, too much. Yeah. And the lens I try and look at it through is I I always joke my team, like think about like a great salesperson. What do they really like doing? They like problem solving. They like listening and hearing exactly what, what the pain point is. And then being able to create that solution in their head and present it in a really great way that persuades the customer to, to take the action that they would want to take. And they want to close that deal and they want that satisfaction of, of that win, right? They don't want to go put notes in a CRN. Like they don't like that part of it. Like, and so where can we take the things that they do like and then automate the things that they don't, right? If they can move something to closed one, which is a good feeling, that's like ringing the bell, right? Move it over to close one. And then when they do that, it automates a services agreement going out to that customer, the customer signs that services agreement, and then it automatically takes them to the onboarding uh, part of the process. And then they get some sort of uh, welcome packet uh, for being part of the product or service. Salespeople like that kind of automation, right? Mm-hmm. They, don't, they don't have to touch anything. That's awesome, right? That's the, that's the good stuff. 
It's when you get in the way of their deal and you get no, uh, and you start interrupting some of the communication that they're having and you take away the control to your point, that's when things can, can get can murky. So I think if you just think about how do you make that person's life better, generally there's a great way to balance the tools uh, and, uh, and, and the other. And uh, kind of speaking of, because this is absolutely an area where sales can let down marketing, where we're not updating the CRM. I, I would uh, maybe nitpick on your definition of the salesperson. I'd probably pull out the word persuading because I, I think the the new version of sales, I don't think there's really any persuasion going on. I think it's trying to dig and understand you know where the prospect's coming from. And as a salesperson, your job is to understand the progress you can help your customers make and see if that progress is what they're looking for. And then you're just kind of aligning what they're looking for and what you can do. It, it's funny. I think persuasion has an unfair negative connotation. Like, I, I think that if, if you're coming from a place of authenticity and you really believe that your product or service is going to solve that problem, then you are, you are persuading, right? Like it just, it, it, it just sounds creepy. You get it, right? Like, oh, and then I'm persuaded him to do something you didn't really want to do. Yeah, that, that's not good. But, you know, sometimes people need the persuasion that they need to go where they actually need to go. And I think if you come from a good place, I mean, we don't have to argue too much over uh, over words, but I do think if you're coming from a good place, uh, persuasion is not necessarily as uh, negative as it might sound. Yeah, I, I think the the piece where I like, I, I think is maybe worth a conversation. I think a lot of people are big on the challenger sale. And the challenger sale is persuasion by a, we have this ideology, about this is how this is how our product service offering et cetera et cetera should work, and I know they did a big study on it, but I also have friends that work in science and I understand what p hacking is, and I'm not accusing challenger sale of doing any of that. I've probably done some of that myself, or you know, looking for data to support my case. 100 percent not a scientist here. I think most of what we do in sci in sales and marketing is not science or anything close to statistically significant. It's sort of like less better than randomized guessing, hopefully. Um, but I think the, my beef with like the word persuasion is like any time I've really tried to step in and have influence in a prospect, even if it was coming from a good place, um, the, it, I don't think it's gone well. I don't, I don't think as a salesperson, I don't think that's my role. I think my role is to understand, you know, I like, I like to ask questions and I'll make a recommendation. You know, I can think of one example in the last year where I've really stood up and been like, oh, you know what? I'm not a you know, if you're going to any other competitor, I'd, I'd be silent and say, hey, good luck. But this one in particular, uh, we, we get a lot of customers from them and people aren't happy. And that was the the kind of one time where I was like really going to maybe put my American, pull my American passport out and put the Canadian passport in the desk and be like, all right, mm -hmm. oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it, when I, when you think through the lens of persuasion or when you think about, um, I think about at giving salespeople advice to be persuasive, it's very, very easy to over rotate on. You're trying to convince, you're trying to challenge, you're trying to tell the customer how they should think. And I think the a better way to think about it or a more helpful way to think about it is to try and understand the progress that they want to make and see if that progress aligns with the, you know, the progress the customer wants to make, see if that aligns with the progress our product or service our offering can help them make and just make a recommendation and then be there to answer questions. I mean, that that's my sales process in like 30 seconds it's mm -hmm. probably persuasive but it's not um i'm not intentionally persuasive i i'm not going out of my way to be persuasive i'm going out of my way to understand and to dig um, but i'm not telling i'm not saying oh you're doing that wrong you know i if a customer wants to do something the wrong way i say yeah we won't we won't do that you want to you're going to do outbound for six weeks probably not going to be a good fit Okay. Um, and let me kind of ask you offline what that company was, because I think I may have used them once. I'm very tempted to say the name, but I won't. Um, where I was going with this is you had made a comment about salespeople updating their updating their sales force, which is, I think, an area where salespeople fall down all the time. Uh, I'll call out this podcast is not sponsored by Dooley. I'm just a huge Dooley fan. If your sales team is struggling with this, go check them out, Dooley.ai. I use them all the time. The best feature I'm always jumping meeting to meeting and you, they, they integrate with my Google and I click on the meeting, I join the zoom. Then I go back to my Google calendar and it says like 
take notes in Dooley and it automatically has like the Salesforce note and everything. And I can type notes directly into Salesforce. It's the best. It's made us getting sales like data into our Salesforce super, super easy. So that is a solution I will offer. We're not paid to say this. I know the company. I, I'm a big fan. I was one of their first users. Like they don't, they don't ask me to do this. I just kind of do it every now and then when it comes up because I like it. There's, there's another step you could even do with that. If you utilize one of the uh, AI tools, I, I use Fireflies where instead of going and typing your own notes, you can literally copy and paste a transcript into the, uh, into there. You've got everything. So about, um, a lot, yeah. of, a lot of things you can do to, to automate that, the CRM process. I think it, I, I agree with you. I, I've got chorus that follows me around and fireflies and uh, phantom fathom and all of these. I, I love note taking apps as like note taking apps. I think there's value in a human sitting at the end of a call and going, what do I want to do next? And we have a couple of, I I, I take notes throughout the call because I want to remember the conversation, but at the end of every call, what I try and do, or what I, we have like a little template and I have two fields in Salesforce that I update. I have next, a next step field. It's a plain text field and I have a date field and I, update the date field to this is what I get, or I update the next step field to Colin, this is what you need to do next. This is what's going to happen. We have a call booked for the 24th. Uh, we, in between now and then, I'm going to send a proposal. I'm going to update these two things. This is what's going to change on their side. Next step date is the 24th. That way, when I look at my pipeline in a pipeline view, I can sort by next action date and I can see any old next actions that I haven't executed on. And then I can see what's coming up for today tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. See if I want to pull, pull anything forward or push anything back. Um, and so I think providing, again, it comes down to like when there are failures, it's about systems and process, sometimes about tools. For me, the system of getting these two fields into Salesforce, huge improvement because now my sales team uses Salesforce as a productivity tool, not as a repository. If mm-hmm. You know, in in a lot of CRM setups, if it's not a productivity tool, it's admin work and you don't want to do it. But if it is where I go to keep track of all the things that I'm doing, all the things that I need to do, this is my system. I used to have this like spiral bound binder that I would carry around in my truck with me when I was an area rep. That was my CRM and my to-do. I would like staple cards in there. It was ugly and janky, but it worked really well. And it took me until I had next action dates and next action fields, um, in my CRM and I, I had views set up to um, support that, that I actually started using my CRM as a productivity tool instead of just a place for dashboards. And so when, I, when you look at the behavior of salespeople don't update Salesforce, there's always the balance of like, okay, well, what is the what are the processes and what are the tools and systems available to them? Um, and then what is marketing asking for? Because if you're asking me for 800 fields, well, I can tell you where you can go put your 800 fields. But if you want, you know, two or three good ones, if you want me to update the status on something, if you want me to, you know, whatever, fine, but make it easy for me and make sure it integrates into my workflow, kind of bridging into the automation that if you're gonna, if you want a salesperson to do it, to do it, make sure it's part of their system. Make sure it's supporting a workflow that they're already involved in. That's a, that's a great lens to start looking through that. And, you know, cause we definitely hit stubborn salespeople all the time and it's how we turn the CRM process, the CRM into a productivity tool and not a repository. I, I really like that. I think that's a good takeaway. Um, and, uh, and we'll have to frame, uh, frame things to, uh, help, help some of those stubborn sales, sales folks get over. I don't know. hundred percent. Um, speaking of stubborn sales folks, I know, you know, one thing is not updating Salesforce and we kind of touched on it earlier, but not following up on leads, not taking notes, not updating Salesforce. All of this results in a lack of feedback, of good feedback to marketing, other than F those guys, they didn't bring any good leads. Um, I think the one one area where sales folks, sales teams can do a better job is providing that you know real-time feedback uh, to marketing, because it, especially if you're in control of a sizable marketing spend and a salesperson, say they're taking a, an additional week to log their notes and get that data in. And then the manager has to throw it into a dashboard and then feed it back in a meeting to the marketing team. It could be two weeks of like misuse spend where, you know, I very easily could have just gone to, you know, Sarah, the marketer and said, Hey, Sarah, you know, this list or these leads or this one didn't feel that great. Or this one, you know, doesn't look, it looks like we're a little bit out on our profile. You know, if we're able to get those in more real time, 
you know, close, shorten, shortening the feedback cycle or that feedback loop time is, uh, I think can be really important. And I, as a salesperson, I think I've been very guilty of it as somebody running sales and marketing. I've seen the impact of real time or near time feedback, uh, can have positively on a marketing campaign. I'm curious your thoughts here. Uh, do you like fast feedback? Do you like a more structured, you know, weekly, monthly, quarterly feedback cycle? What does that look like for you? I think when it comes to feedback, I think you always want to have the right setting, especially if you're in, uh, you know, a different department where sometimes you're you're colliding. So I know uh, for for me, my favorite setting for feedback is being able to create kind of uh, like the EOS level tens. Are you familiar with EOS? Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be able to create kind of a level ten type meeting with uh, my my growth team where we're working together, sales and marketing, and so that feedback is happening on a regular basis, uh, but it's also a safe space, right? We've learned how to conflict re uh, res uh, resolve with one another. And we're, we're, it's like, Hey, we we're all, we're all growing in the same direction. We know where we're going. I got to know if this, if this is any good. So I think is as structured as you can get with your cadence, uh, going back to those systems and processes, as structured as you get, can get with everyone talking to one another and making feedback seem like one of those things where marketing wouldn't feel attacked in that, in that setting. Um, mm -hmm. and sales wouldn't just feel like they're complaining or just, you know, I, I know for me and I, no one's ever called me patient ever. Uh, but I, so I can see why sales many times will be like, well, you know what? I'm just, I'm not even gonna deal with it. I'm, I'm not going to take the time to sit here and tell you exactly how it is and say, Hey, I, I think we're going to improve your buddy. I could, I can totally see why it's like, okay, you know what marketing we're, we're, we're I'm, I'm done. I'll do, do I'll, I'll find my own leads. I'll convert it myself. I don't need you. Uh, and it's, uh, I, I know I've, I've, I've seen that happen. So, uh, I do think it's, it's, it's really important to be able to have structured communication, uh, for, for both parties. I love that. I think so much of this comes down to alignment, whether we look at the problems on the marketing side, problems on the sales side, it comes down to alignment of priorities coming down from leadership through the marketing and sales leaders, which you start to see in process or lack thereof. And then, you know, a lack, if you don't have good process, then it doesn't matter what you're doing with the tools, right? You can be dangerous, you can be helpful, but I think so much of that is dictated by, do you have really strong processes that were there first? And now you're using the tools to enforce the process. And, you know, from the very top, do you have really strong alignment between all different parties, revenue, product, marketing, sales, leadership? Yeah, I definitely think the leadership is the most important. Having a leader who understands sales and marketing and can serve as both a uh, a guide to both as well as a principal uh, who makes sure that everybody's playing nice in the sandbox is uh, I think is really really important and is what really sets the tone for those uh, systems and processes. Hundred percent, Austin. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, before you go, I wanted to ask you about your M two S process because we talked a little bit about EOS a few minutes ago. Talking mm -hmm. about the M2S process and a little bit about attack and what they do. So one of my favorite things about EOS is that I feel like it simplifies things for the the CEO slash visionary archetype, right? And I think that uh, it just makes sense. It's okay, here's it's simple, great, okay. And one thing I recognize though is when it comes to the marketing strategy part of EOS, it's like three lines, maybe. Maybe it's a little too simple. Uh, and so what I uh, what I like to, to do is I'm kind of expanded on what I feel like is inspired by EOS is really defining the right principles of your brand across your vision, your comms, your audience, you know, understanding your target audience, and then the data. Uh, getting that down fairly quickly, only expanding a little bit on what you would do in EOS, but for companies who haven't you know, gone through that process, just really understanding who your target market is, your value propositions that you're going to go at them with, and then important metrics that you need to understand, such as, you know, what, you know, your average lifetime value of a customer is so that you can understand what your ROI is looking like and can really start measuring everything that you're doing to get the right spin. But the, the heart of the M2S framework is when we take all of that and then we create uh, a very pragmatic, purposeful plan where we understand which tactics we need to attract the prospect, convert a prospect into an opportunity, 
close an opportunity into a customer and delight a customer. And we go into those four buckets, we create a tactic that is a KPI and a base creative approach. Nothing, not like here's a, you know, here's the exact uh, phrase that we're going to go, but just more like this is the value proposition that we align with. And mm -hmm. we go through that for, uh, for each persona, we go through each one of those buckets and we identify those things and we put a response, a person responsible for each of those. Many times it's on the internal side. Other times it's an agency partner like Attack Interactive. And then we have our plan of attack, right? And no pun intended there. Um, and the one thing, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The one thing though is once you build that plan, there is a gap between building a plan and executing a plan. There's implementation that always needs to happen. Technology, resources, content, uh, and uh, process typically are kind of the four that I see. So once we create a plan, we implement all the things that we need to, uh, you know, get all the automation that we need and, and to the, uh, you know, HubSpot or whatever uh, tool we're using for that. Uh, and then from there, then we execute month over month. And we're always looking at the KPIs that we put together because, again, we're responsible to the results. So that's our basic framework that we, we run our customers on. And I think that uh, people really like it because it's easy to follow, but also they know what we have to hit for you know, successful, right? There's no throwing dark. There's no hoping something works. It's really clear. We need to get this result from all of this work and it needs to lead to X amount of revenue. So that's, a, that's the framework. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, what, what we do here at Attack Interactive. I love it. Austin, thank you so much for coming on the show. If people are looking to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to reach out? Just head over to our website, www.attackinteractive.com. Love it. Right on. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks to everybody for listening. We'll see you all next week.